Bibles. If you don't have a copy of the Scripture with you today, uh, wave frantically or look around. And there are plenty of uh, Bibles in the chairs around us. I want you to be able to have a copy of the Scripture this morning so that you will know uh, what God says. And boy, it would be too bad if you thought that what I preached this morning uh, is what I say. It would be too bad if you picked up something about me instead of about about God. He's what we're here uh, to learn about today. And we have been in the last four weeks, well, uh, we have been looking at the topic of the matter specifically of worship. And it is, I believe, an eye-opener for most of us. We asked in the beginning, what's the purpose of a man? What's a man created for? By this I mean mankind. What was man created to do? What was he made for? What? Worship God. To worship God. Man is made to worship God. And then uh, we mentioned, and I think this is re uh, uh, relatively accurate, that if we were to be asked to write an essay on worship, that probably most of us could write pages or at least paragraphs, and maybe some of us could write books about worship. But if we were given a test on what worship is, we'd probably fail it. And that is a matter for some reflection. I, you say, Pastor, what makes you think that? Because I've, I've questioned people about worship. I've read books on worship, and uh, they don't even know what worship is. Individuals who are writing books about worship, who are literally, vocationally worship leaders, worshipers, don't know what worship is worship is. And it isn't because it's a grand mystery. It isn't because it cannot be easily known. It's because we oftentimes just begin with a conception or with something that we just want. And then we work off of that. And so the first week we, we defined worship and uh, we were in John chapter 4 and we looked at the Samaritan woman, the woman we call the woman at the well. And we looked at what... <clears throat> Jesus' encounter with her brought into the conversation. And as He had revealed to her things that He knew about her that really only a prophet could know. One, that she had had uh, five husbands and the one that she was with was not her husband. And that if He would ask of her that, he could, that she could receive out, uh, uh, out of her belly could flow water, that would, He would give her the kind of water that she would never thirst again if <coughs> she asked of Him. And when she perceived that he was a prophet, she immediately segued into asking about worship. She said, Sir, you know, I perceive thou art a prophet. And then she said, Our fathers, you know, worship here in this mountain, but the Jews, they say that you have to worship at Jerusalem. And Jesus' answer to her was that the, the hour is going to come when you're not going to worship in the mountain or at Jerusalem. Uh, he said, "Worship the or that you're going to worship the Father neither in the mountain or in Jerusalem." And then he said, "Ye worship, ye know not what." So you're worshiping something and you don't know what it is. And he said, "We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews." And you know, I think that sometimes that that harsh indictment for worship could pretty well blanket sweep what the church does, practically speaking, for worship. You worship, you know not what. And it ought to be, we know what we worship. That ought to be our response. We know what we worship. We know what we're doing when we worship. And, uh, you know, there, there are aspects where, you know, you can go this direction and be wrong or go this direction and be wrong. There are individuals who say, that's not worship. But they don't worship at all themselves. And so, it's important for us to realize what Jesus said. He said, we know what we worship. You don't know what you worship. And then He said, he said for salvation is of the Jews. He said, that's the truth, that you have to worship at Jerusalem. Now, we talked about how that worship at Jerusalem uh, was costly. We talked about how that it was uh, dangerous. We talked about how that you had to travel. I mean, if you weren't from Jerusalem, it was inconvenient to worship at Jerusalem. Worshiping in the top of a mountain was far more convenient, but the problem with it was that God said, I don't want to be worshipped in the top of the mountain. And so then Jesus concluded with this part that we know, 
uh, we've probably memorized verse 24 of John. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Yes, God can be on the mountain. He's a spirit. He can be anywhere. He is everywhere. But when you worship God, you go to God God's way. Now, this is not the message for today, but in the Old Testament, uh, there are, or in the Bible, I should say, Old and New Testament, I'm, we're going to read our text in a minute. Don't, I, I haven't forgotten. I just want to get us uh, to the place before we read it to uh, have our minds focused for it. Uh, in, the, in the Bible, the word worship is referred to 108 times, uh, which is quite a few. <clears throat> in many of the contexts where the word worship is used, God is not the object of worship. Idols are the object of worship. High places are the object of worship. And actually, when the Scripture is referring to that same worship, God is, is uh, rebuking it. God is against what is done in the name of worship in those contexts. Seventy times the word worshipped, as in the past tense, is used. Uh, five times worshiping is used. Worshipeth is used six times. And so, you know, there are nearly 200 times when worship is talked about in the Scripture. And we learned that in every instance, the word worship means to bow. Yes. To bow. When I read books on worship, and even for uh, preparing for this series, I uh, tried to find resources just to hear, you know, somebody's preached something or uh, uh, has, has learned something uh, from the Word of God that could be a help. I'm happy to hear it. And I, I read a lot of books on worship, and every single one of the ones, not every single one, almost every single one of the ones that I read were about praise. Talking about praise, there are seven words, or seven different types of praise. And most believers mistakenly think that worship and praise are synonyms, and they are not. In other words, praise is a dimension of worship, but praise is not worship, and worship is not praise. Worship has a lot of aspects, or we could say dimensions. In other words, offering could be uh, a part of our worship. Praise could be part of our worship. Sacrifice could be part of our worship. Uh, approbation, uh, or to, to, to declare things about God, could be worship. There are many things that could be part of worship, but they are not worship. Worship is bowing reverential bowing before God. And that is what worship is. Worship is not more complex than that. Worship is that simple. And we have, I believe, been guilty of making worship first, praise, and then expanding from there. And it is so convoluted, the concept that most believers have of worship that we really don't have a clue what the truth is, and I don't believe that's of God. Now, let me uh, practically apply something. So that, was, that would be a fallacy of worship, I guess. Uh, we could say when we looked at the fallacies of worship is that uh, praise is worship. And then another fallacy of worship is that worship is defined by us and not by God. So we saw two weeks, we saw fallacies of worship. The first week was that uh, the fallacy or the thing that isn't true about worship is that we define worship. We don't. We discover what God says is worship, and we worship that way. And that's a fallacy in worship, that worship is defined by us and not by God. The second fallacy of worship, then, is what I also previously mentioned, in that uh, worship is synonymous with any other specific word. Worship it does not have a specific synonym. It's not praise. It's not sacrifice. It's not thanksgiving. It's not, in other words, those are dimensions of worship. It's not admiration. Again, dimensions, aspects. But they are not the definition for what worship is. Now, let's go uh, to Isaiah chapter 2. You've been there for a while, and you're wondering if we're ever going to read the Scripture. Well, we'll read a lot to make up for getting, being so long and getting there. How's that? Isaiah chapter 2, will you please look down to verse 6? This is an indictment to Judah which would have been that part of the kingdom of Israel, of course, that would have had Jerusalem as its capital, that would have had the temple, and that would not, in general terms, have set up high places. Verse 6 of Isaiah 2. 
Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasure. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. Notice the context of worship here, will you? They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore, forgive them not. Now look at verse 10. Enter into the rock, and hide thee in the dust, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of His majesty. Will you please go down with me to verse 17. This is speaking of the day of the Lord. The loftiness and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of man shall be made low. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the cleft of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? Now we'll pray. And uh, we will look at, again today, we'll kind of come full circle and see that truth is the key to worship. Father, please help us today. Help me not to uh, forsake of volume of material to, to, not, to not say too much. And God, help me not to say really anything that isn't about you and your work. And God, I pray that this morning that you would really convince us what worship is in a way that would be a help to us in a permanent way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just want to look today again. Uh, I want to go back to really where we began and, and emphasize the truth that truth is the key to worship. Truth is the key to worship. Jesus told the woman at the well... He said, you worship what you know not. We know what we worship. And then he said that God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit. Yes, you're right that God's a spirit. But you can't just worship Him as a spirit. He's not a spirit, He's the spirit. And to know who He is as the spirit, you must worship Him in truth. And truth, my friend, is what ought to grip us. Truth is what we ought to uh, hold fast to. And truth is something that we ought to accept nothing in place of. And the fact is, is that what worship is, is to bow before God. Most worship, actually, that is referred to in the Word of God, is referred to as worship of something other than God. Friend, just because it's worship does not mean that it's truth. Just because it's worship does not mean that God approves. And actually, the opposite is true. If God does not approve of individuals who fashion beautiful little idols from silver and from gold, and eventually makes it so that when the day of the Lord comes, that people take their idols of gold and they throw them off the cliff, and they go into a cleft of the cliff where the bats dwell, into a cleft in the rock, and they become waste and they become trash. That's what God thinks of false worship. You say, my friend, why is God so exclusive? Because He's the only one. That's why. There isn't a God except for God. That's why. God is exclusive and He ought to be exclusive because if you worship anything but God, you're not worshiping God. And your worship is a waste. It's a farce. It is for your feelings. It is to satisfy something in you that you've worshipped. But my friend, it isn't true. There are individuals who literally are running organizations in ministry and they're all about worship and they actually are worshiping, but what they worship is not God. Truth. 
Truth is what we seek in worship. Truthfully, when is the last time the God, that God's people have understood that bowing before God is worship? You say, Pastor, oh, we know that. We know that this, that simple. Well, let me just put it this way, practically speaking. How much did you worship last week? How much did you worship last week? How much time did you get alone and just bow? Just bow before God. I've met people before that have told me, you know, worship is something that's just really my thing. I'm really good at it. Someone one time told me, I'm a super worshiper. And uh, they talked about worshiping and uh, they, I've had people tell me, you know, I just get, I just get my MP3 player, or back in the days of a Walkman, you know, the Sony Walkman, the tape player. Yes, they had things called tapes that you could get music off of from a device that could read the tapes, uh, and then, uh, you know, but I get that. I put my headphones on. And I just dance with Jesus, and I just worship, and uh, that isn't worship. That's dancing is what that is. It's not worship. Uh, I just, you know, I get in my car and man, I'll tell you sometimes when I turn the music up and, and uh, you know, it's just me and, and the music uh, and God and, uh, you know, I just can't help but just, I just sing at the top of my lungs and I don't care if anybody sees me because I am singing to Jesus in my car and I'm worshiping God. Well, that's singing to Jesus. That isn't worship. Worship's bowing down. Do you know when you bow down, you can't do much else? Think about that. When a person bows in reverence, their mouth is closed. So when, when you come to a place of reverence, you don't have anything. Have you ever been just silenced? When you bow before God, my friend, it silences you. And there is in worship and bowing before God, a silencing. If you can say something, you'll say what Isaiah said when he saw God high and lifted up and he said, Woe is me! Oh no! God is holy and I'm unclean. God, this is what you are. God, this is what I am. And my friend, there isn't much reaching up to God in that. There is a bowing down. There is a low Lowliness. What's the purpose of bowing down? To get low. To get down. Because God is high and we're low. It's, it is a dimensional, it's a dimensional concept. In other words, God's here and we're here. God's here because of His holiness and we're here because of our unholiness. Now we recognize what happens when God cleanses us. It takes away the separation between us and Him. We're lifted up. And then we're sent to the lowly. How much did you worship last week? How much bowing down did you accomplish last week? How much time did you spend bent? With your knees bent. And with yourself looking down. As in your heart you're just looking at God and saying, God... You're so high, you're so lifted up. We call our service a worship service. But how much do we bow in our service? I'm a little afraid. I'm a little afraid to ask you to bow in a service. I'm afraid some of y'all wouldn't come back. I didn't come there to bow. I come there to bend. But I think if we're going to call it a worship service, there needs to be some bowing, doesn't there? There needs to be some bending, doesn't there? And I'm always afraid of doing things ritualistically. I'm always afraid of getting caught in we're doing this because this is the impression we want to give off instead of we're doing this because this is the truth. But there needs to be bowing in worship. And I don't know what the amount needs to be, but I think it's not worship unless there's bowing, don't you? And so maybe we ought to be honest about what we call our worship service. Or maybe we need to worship in our service. That would be the better alternative, wouldn't it? To bow. 
to bow. I think it's a wonderful thing at the end of a preaching service to just respond. Just respond. I don't believe in the, you know, trying to get people to come forward so we can count numbers in the invitation. Many times because of the size of our congregation, many times we forego the invitation because if someone uh, needs to pray with someone or do business with God, uh, they can just talk to me. It's not one of those things where it's real complicated to know something's going on. Someone raises their hand during the invitation. I don't have to have them come during the time of invitation. I can talk to them afterward or privately or so forth. We don't want to have an invitation because of you know it being what we do, that being the way that we do things, and that's just the ritual. But my friend, it'd be good during the invitation just to have a time and say, oh me, and to bow, and to worship God. Just have a time in our service where we worship God. And I think that might be an appropriate time for it. To just respond and say, God, I've seen you. And now that I've seen you, I've seen myself. I've seen you in the light of your word, in the mirror of what is said, I've seen my reflection, and as a consequence of it, I have realized that you are holy, yeah. and that I'm unclean, right. and so I bow before you, and I worship you. I do not think you can come into the presence of God with great pride. I love the verse that's over here on our, on our uh, wall, the part of the verse in Psalm 138. Matter of fact, if you have a minute, we're going to go further in Isaiah, but if you have a minute, let's go to Psalm 138. I want to read something about worship there in Psalm 138. This is the theme of our church. Years ago when we had the vision to begin Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, we asked ourselves, what do we want the distinctives of this church? What's the, what, is God, what is God having us uh, start a ministry for? What is our church's purpose? It needs to have a reason. It's not just, well, you know, another church. It needs to have a purpose for existing. And there are distinctives that our church has. One of our distinctives is just has to do with God's Word and God's name. Verse 1, I will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods, small g, gods, will I sing praise to thee. In other words, I'll stand before the fake gods and I will sing praise to the real God but to let the fake gods know you're not God. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving <coughs> kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Look down to verse 6. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Let's read that again. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. You ever feel distant in your relationship to God? Try bowing. Try bowing. Maybe you're a little bit too high up and God said, I can't see you up there. Too far away. The Bible says He hath respect unto the, what's that word? Low. Lowly. Bowing is lowliness. It's lowering ourselves. Literally, it's saying, God, I'm all the way down here. I'm all the way down here. God says, I can reach you there. I can see you there. I'm near you when you're there. If God wants to lift you up, let Him lift you up, but don't lift yourself up. And so much of what we call worship is lifting up oneself. Man, what a tragedy it is that in a worship service, it has become more like performing, which lifts up a person, which attracts attention to a person, than it is... Bowing. Would to God that our song would diminish us and give Him the preeminence. Would to God that when we worship, when we represent in worship, that people look right beyond us and into the heavens where God is. I'm not going to come up with any strange new habits or doctrines but wouldn't it be appropriate if our praise singers bowed when they sang? Or knelt when they sang? Wouldn't it be something if we deliberately had diminished persons 
so that He could increase and we could decrease. That's worship. God's not near those that lift themselves up. They're far off. God says, I, you, you, I can hardly see you over there. You're way out there. But a person who is lowly, God says, I know right where you are. You're right by me. You want to get into God's presence, you better learn to worship. Do you hear me? If you want to get into God's presence, you better learn to worship. And so often we want to go to God and we want to say, okay, God, I only have so much time, so let me just go ahead and give you the list. Instead of saying, oh God, where are you? Oh God, I need you. Oh God, there isn't anything else that I have to do but bow before you. This is it. This is all for me. It's all I need. Listen, if we're made to worship God, we're made to bow. And if you're all out of sorts and you can't figure out what's wrong in your life, it's probably because you're too lifted up instead of lowered down, lowly. God resisteth the proud, but He giveth grace unto the lowly. And friend, there's a humility about worship. There's a humility about worship. It's kind of tongue-in-cheek sometimes when someone does such a great job of singing a worship song or uh, performing, I call it, a lot of times, that when you, you give them a praise, they kind of deflect a little bit by saying, Praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> I don't know. I think sometimes they don't mean it. I don't know anybody's heart. I don't know anyone's heart. But we sure do like to have praise. And God deserves it, not us. And when we bow, people look right over us. But God looks right at us. Bowing, lowliness, is an important avenue or aspect to worship. Now, if you'll go with me to Isaiah chapter 28, it'll be the last reference that we'll turn to this morning. And it is still morning. We've got about six minutes left of morning. Isaiah. Did I say 28? I, I should have said 36. I'll never have to worry about y'all being impressed with me. <laughs> That'll be a real misunderstanding. Isaiah chapter 36. <clears throat> There's a lot of application in this little passage of Scripture here. I wish I could. I wish that I were preaching through Isaiah, and this is where we landed for today's message on worship. But we've just come to here because it's a place that applies. Wish we knew all the context. Isaiah was a prophet to particularly the nation of Judah, though some of his prophecy was also to Israel. We understand the kingdoms of Israel and Judah were divided. Ten of the tribes were with Israel. Two of the tribes were with Judah. And uh, Isaiah had a <coughs> privileged ministry as far as prophets go. Uh, most prophets were just not well received at all. Most of the prophets in Israel had a bounty on their heads. And Isaiah wasn't completely the exception to that, but in many ways he was. Many, he first of all was related to royalty, and he actually had access to the palace. Unlike many prophets, he didn't have to come in by just the power of God. He had access as a person. Personally, Isaiah had access. And uh, he, he was a prophet under four kings in Israel. And a couple of them were pretty good kings. Hezekiah was a pretty good king in Israel. Now, as a man, I despise Hezekiah. Now, don't, don't judge me. Well, you can judge me. It's okay. But I just I, there's just not very much manliness about Hezekiah as a king of Israel. I mean, give me David as far as kings go. You know, I like a tough guy myself. I mean, David had the had the ability to to just weep and cry over his sin before God. But I'm gonna tell you something: David didn't weep or cry to a man. I mean, there wasn't a man in the world that David was afraid of ever. And I just I like that about David. Hezekiah was a sissy. I mean, he was afraid of everybody. He was afraid of his own shadow. He was afraid of dying. And uh, you know. I mean, honestly, if you just study the life of Hezekiah, and I have, I'm just like, man, you'd, I'd have a hard time with this guy. He was a millennial before they were invented. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> it was terrible. He, he literally just lacked manliness and uh, didn't really have much shame for it. Uh, the Syrians are coming. They're threatening Judah. And Hezekiah <coughs> is afraid of the Syrians. And he did love the Lord. But uh, the Syrians are coming. And so this guy, Rabshika, comes and stands in, uh, by the wall, by the water gate or whatever. And uh, all the men of Israel are sitting on the wall listening. And he speaks in the Hebrew tongue and just threatens King Hezekiah and God's people. And I mean, he just he gives a very, very bold speech and basically says, are you going to trust Hezekiah, <laughs> manly man Hezekiah, to deliver you? And uh, he, he, the one that took away the high places and said you have to worship the Lord at Jerusalem, that Hezekiah, let me tell you something about, uh, about Hezekiah. He is a coward and he can't save you from us. We're coming and you can't stop us and he said, and the Lord sent me. So, the Lord isn't with Hezekiah, the Lord's with me. Go to, I think it's verse 10 of uh, Isaiah 36. Let's see here, let me check. Yeah, he said, and am I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, go up against this land and destroy it. Now, he uses L-O-R-D caps. Jehovah God. He uses the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Jehovah, to talk about the Lord sent me. And I don't know about you, but that's a little bit intimidating. Because if God sent this Syrian, not only are the Syrians frightening, but we're in trouble. And did God send, did God send the unrighteous to judge his people at times? Sure. My goodness, God used Nebuchadnezzar in a wonderful way and humbled him too. And so that could be true, couldn't it? So what does Hezekiah does do? Well, he puts on sackcloth and ashes and he starts bawling. In verse 1 of chapter 37, look here. It came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and <clears throat> went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the scribe and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth unto Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is <coughs> excuse me, a day of trouble and of rebuke and of blasphemy, for the children are come to birth, for there, and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria his master has sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that's left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say unto the master, Thus saith the Lord. Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I'll send a blast upon him. And <clears throat> he's not going to send Hezekiah, notice. I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Now, let me make some mean comments about Hezekiah here, just because I can't help it. Uh, God didn't say, Hezekiah, be of good strength. He didn't do it like he did with Gideon and say, thou mighty man of valor. God said, Hezekiah, I'll destroy him in his own land. You won't even have to be there. It's amazing, isn't it? Hezekiah was one of the two great kings in Israel. One of only two kings that ever put away the high places. Only two kings ever did. Hezekiah was one of them. And that's about the only courageous thing he ever did in his lifetime. And yet, really, as far as the kings in Israel go, as far as God's word accounting for them, he is one of the greatest kings Israel ever had. Not because of his own courage or because of his own wisdom or his own strength. or uh, It was just simply because Hezekiah knew how to fall down before God. Rabshakeh comes and says, The Lord's with me and I'm going to destroy you and don't you even think that you have a chance. And they fell down. They said, Oh no, what will we do? And they sent to, to Isaiah and said, well, maybe he's lying. And God said, 
That isn't the truth. Who did he say it to? He said it to a man that knew how to bow. Said it, said it to a person that knew how to bow. You know, my friend, I recognize that even with as few people as are here this morning, that there are circumstances in your lives individually or circumstances in those that are near to you that are far beyond your ability to do anything but to despair. And oftentimes we, the last thing we'll do is to just bow before God and say, God, it's too much. And really, God, I just need you and I just need to know that you're in control. Most of the time we have a lot of plotting and scheming and working to do. And sometimes we never even come to the place where we just bow and worship God. Sometimes we play the game with God of if you'll do this, the bargaining game. If you'll do this, then I will. And we worship as though it's some sort of a manipulative tool. But what God actually simply wants from us is truth in worship. Do we truly worship God? Do we truly worship Him? We said as part of our message two weeks ago, you cannot believe that there is a flaw or a fault with God and worship Him. I've heard people say, you know, I just there are some things about God that I just don't understand. I just have to accept that He's God. But what they really mean by that is that this is not right about God. They'll say something like, you know, I just don't think that, you know, I don't understand why God would allow evil. I don't understand why God would allow that. And what they're saying is there's something that isn't quite right about God. My friend, you can't worship God if you think there's something wrong with Him. Yeah. Or people that say, you know, I don't understand why uh, God judges. I don't understand why He can be so harsh and so demanding and so exacting. And why it has to be just His way. And I don't understand why, you know, we can't have a little attitude in some areas where the Bible just seems like God is just very, very rigid. And my friend, if you think that, if you think that, you cannot bow to God because you think there's something wrong with Him. But if you'll see God as holy, and you'll see God as high and lifted up, you'll see that all He does is right. And everything that He is is truth. And you'll see anything in you that's a contradiction of that as unholy. And it'll bring you to a place where you can truly bow. And you can just say, God, I worship You. I bow before You. I reverence You. I give You the place of esteem in my heart and my life. And my friend, that's coming to a place of truth. It's fascinating to me because in Isaiah we see Rabshikeh says, you worship that God. That's his accusation. And Hezekiah comes around and says, yes, I do. And God delivered him. <laughs> There's not even really good detail about it. I'll send a blast. There was a rumor that there were problems at home and they went home and somebody else defeated them. And, and his little army, his big army, went away. And Hezekiah never had to do anything at all. Because he knew how to worship. I think that when you and I have problems, the first thing we ought to do is worship. But oftentimes it's the last thing we want to do. Or it's the last thing we actually do. we got a problem, and the last thing we'll do is bow and worship. It's as though our problems cause us to bow up and arch our backs and put a, puff out our chests and just give it the best that we can. And we refuse to 
to bow. God's pleased by worship. Man was made to worship. And you'll be out of sorts, confused, and a mess unless you worship in truth. Much worship is a facade. Much of what is done in the name of worship is pretend. Matter of fact, of all of the believers that I know that seem as though they burn out or they get discouraged or they quit, it seems often that it's those that think that it praise is worship. And they're professional praisers. I mean they do it for a living. And man, you'll see somebody, he was the praise leader of this church or he traveled and did this and this and this and you'll see him and a couple years later he's so far away from God you don't know if he ever even knew God. And why is that? Well, because that isn't worship. I think because oftentimes people who are worship leaders don't know what worship is. If you have the humility to bow, you'd be amazed at the things that would overcome you that God takes care of. And that's the truth. Worship must be in truth. God, Lord, this morning, there's nothing profound, there's nothing really new, but the application of worship here is that, again, it must be in truth. God, we need truth. Lord, the truth is so simple that it just seems as though it must be embellished or added to in order to have enough content to it. But truth, the truth is that worship is simply bowing. And when we come to that truth, we're also confronted with the reality that we bow too little. We worship too little. It's our purpose, and yet we do not bow. So Father, at this time of the service, when we come to a place where we're invited to respond to the truth, I pray that You would bring us to that place of humility in our hearts. Show us our need to bow. Lord, I ask You bless and move in the invitation. Before you lift up your heads and before we finish our prayer, I would like to just ask a couple questions for the invitation this morning. Specifically, the first question I'd like to ask is the most important one, and that is that do you know God? Do you know God on a personal level? Is Jesus your Savior? That has not been the theme of the message here this morning, but Jesus Christ is our theme. If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, you do not know that God is your Father and that you have eternal life, it is something that can be known and can be known simply and confidently. The truth is, is that you're a sinner and that's what separated us from God. He's holy. He's without sin. And the Bible says all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Your sin is what keeps you from knowing that you have eternal life. Truthfully, if you've never received Jesus, you don't have eternal life. You're God's enemy. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus was God's Son and He came as a sinless man. And He died on the cross for sin, having never sinned Himself, because He died in the place of sinners, specifically my sin and your sin. And God offered the plan of redemption, salvation. Just freely offered it universally. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. A child could understand that. When I was a child, I understood that. And I just acknowledged my sin. I said, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I want, I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. I want to be saved because of what Jesus did for me. And God saved me, and He'll save you for the same. You know, this morning, you don't know that you have eternal life. You've never made that decision to receive the free gift of eternal life. And maybe that there is a little bit of understanding lacking in that area still, but we can help you with that. If you're here and you say, Pastor, God's right now God's Holy Spirit, something's in my heart is, is uh, speaking to me about that. Would you slip your hand up, Pastor? I don't know if I'm saved, and I know that that's something God's talking to me about. Slip your hand up so I can see it, and just slip it right back down. Okay, the second question this morning would be in relation to our message. And that would be the matter of bowing. 
I'm not here this morning to give anyone a mandate or to try to move any person by my words. But the practical question from our message this morning is, are you bowing? Are you worshiping God? Is worship your private personal habit? And it might be if the answer to that would be, you know something, the answer to that is not enough or not at all or I'm learning things about worship. Maybe it would be appropriate during the invitation this morning to take time to bow. Just kneel where you're at and bow before God. We know that God is far away from those that are lifted up, but that He's near the lowly. Maybe you feel distant, as though God isn't near you. Maybe you feel in a worship service like this one that just seems like God's presence doesn't seem as real as it could be. Maybe you need to bow to come into His presence. Father, please bless and move in the invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have an invitation this morning, and it is a little different than usual. I'm just going to invite everybody. I'm going to open the hymn book to page 247, and uh, we're going to sing a song, but maybe instead of singing this morning, maybe you'd like to bow. Maybe you'd like to just uh, right where you're at. Just kneel and to go into the presence of God and worship Him. And if that's you, just go right on ahead right now. We'll begin to sing. And as we sing, if you need to bow, you need to deal with God, you do so. Brother Taj is in the back. And if you need someone to pray with you or deal with you about the matter of eternal life, you feel the freedom to do so. We'll sing. And as we sing, if you uh, need to bow, you, you uh, feel free to do that and follow the Lord's leading. Jesus is tenderly called.